Good morning. This morning's scripture is from Matthew 10, verses 7 and 8. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. I was going to give her a thumbs up, but she didn't see it. Can you hear me? We're okay? Okay. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for your amazing love and grace that you bestow upon us. Lord, you created us and gave us the choice knowing we would rebel against you and even as enemies you sent your son to die for us father what gracious love that we have just open our hearts and minds to, to today to hear the words of the spirit to apply them to our lives to realize that our lives are not our own and to realize also that we're fighting a spiritual battle lord over who has kingship of our lives lord may we submit humbly before your throne May we be filled with the love that you give us because we know you, Father, and may we show that love to one another. And join us together with fellowship with one another, Lord. May we run this race together, picking each other up, comforting each other, loving each other as Christ loved us until the return of Christ, Father, when he reigns over all things. Thank you and praise you. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So I entitle this, The Next Week at Church. Because last week's sermon, we were in church. Not here, but we were in church in Nazareth as we were going through the Gospel of Luke. Where the crowds and everything had seen Jesus' ministry, and they knew that Jesus was a man of God. No one could do the things that he did if he wasn't from God. And he came in with a fame, so to speak, into the church. But when he told them the words that they didn't want to hear, they literally tried to murder him, tried to throw him off cliff. Now, I hope you're reading your uh, devotionals. I hope you're reading along. I told you I'll probably be teaching some through Luke, but we're going to look at Mark as well. And as we looked at the scriptures this morning, I noticed that the version, the, the translation, whichever one it was, I, don't, I guess you're reading from NIV, said principalities, I think is what it said. You realize that's demonic activity demons in this world so i thought about entitling this and said the next week at church the demon that was at church because that's what that passage is about and mark records the same thing and as you're looking at that you know luke writes in an orderly account and mark is writing kind of in a chronological account and it's amazing that when mark writes just after the 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 calling of the um disciples the next thing he records is demonic activity in the church and Luke's writing this orderly account, and really, if you're looking, if you don't count the miracle of Jesus walking through the crowd, you know, if you just look at that, it's kind of as an escape or whatever, not a miracle performed for a reason to bring people to Christ. The first miracle recorded in both Gospels is this expulsion of a demonic man in church. And so many times a day, even with the words, we, we want to put it another way, but there are demons among us. It hasn't changed since the beginning of time. They read about de demonic activity in the Old Testament and everything, and it didn't change at Jesus' time. And so many times you'll think, well, the, the activity of demons was heightened when Jesus was, was there. Sure, they were attacking Jesus just as Satan did, but their mission is still the same. And they know their mission. Their mission is to keep people from Jesus Christ. If they can keep them from coming to Christ, then they've gained a soul for all eternity away from God. 
If they can't, they can still come and get all in your business if you allow them. But Matthew and Luke both say the first thing that's there is we need to realize this spiritual battle that we're facing and we need to expel them from our presence. And the only way to do that is to spend more time with God, to, to, to have Him increase our faith, to walk in fellowship with one another, and to be aware of this activity so that we don't just live our lives and say, oh, it's not that way anymore. Ask for prayer to have your eyes opened up and see the activity that's all around you. And be thankful to God that there is angel presence here attending to us as well. We have no idea how many times that forces beyond our measure have taken care of us, given us that way of escape, whatever it is. But it is foolish to think that that activity does not go on today. And that's where we're at in uh, the Gospel of, of Luke. Jesus says in Mark, 15, Mark 1, 15, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent in the good news of the gospel. These are Jesus' first words recorded in the gospel of Mark. They come right after his temptation in the wilderness. What is the kingdom of God? Kingdom has a king. People pledge allegiance to the king. Do you understand the kingdom of God? Because it is at hand. You need to repent change your way of thinking even when it comes to this demonic activity you ask so many christians today and oh that that's not the case and i don't have that problem so many of the problems that we do have even related to sickness and turmoil and everything could possibly be related to demonic activity <clears throat> it's god's presence the kingdom of god is coming to all peoples all cultures healing the brokenness in this world, fulfilling God's promise of salvation and restoration of all things for a sinful, created being who rebelled against Him. Is that how you view and understand the gospel message? And are you part of it as a kingdom citizen? Jesus' next words recorded were recorded to a couple of fishermen going about their normal day-to-day -day activities. Maybe they were aware of demonic activity. Maybe they weren't. Maybe they just got up each day and went to work. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? I'm looking at Barry. I'm looking at Mark. It's part of our lives. And Jesus said, come follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. It turned their world upside down. Their, their days would never be the same after that because they realize that the kingdom of God is at hand. They need to repent of their way of thinking. Sure, they might still go out on the boat and fish. That might be their occupation. That might not be their occupation. But today, I've got to worry about, just as you prayed for, Barry, the salvation of those loved ones I have around. And then as I grow in Christ even more, the salvation of those that I don't know as well. And even then, the salvation of those enemies of mine, because I was an enemy when Christ Jesus died for me. Jesus' authority and the question of whose authority you are following is part of this spiritual kingdom, and then it's played out in the reality of this earthly kingdom. Martin Luther said, The life of Christianity consists in possessive pronouns. It's one thing to say Christ is Lord. It's another to say Christ is my Lord. Possessive pronouns. Is He your Lord? Do you proclaim Him as Lord? Or do you proclaim Him as my Lord? And does your life live that? Is there proof of that? Only a true Christian, tr Christian can say, Christ is my Lord. And if you're saying that, that means that He's Lord of all things. That you don't fear. That you're aware of the things that's going around. around that you fight in the Lord's army. That you stand up. You stand up for Jesus. Have you answered that? What is your response? because it determines the future of your soul for all eternity. It determines everything in the end, so to speak. So there was another day at church, and this was a different church. Next week in a different church. Would today be any different? What would happen when Jesus walked into the synagogue and began preaching? I don't think anybody expected what happened that day. How freaked out would you be in the church today? Come on. But yet, we have no idea the demonic activity that is around us. Trying to keep us from 
Jesus Christ. From knowing him and being like him in this world. So I'm going to read from Mark's account first. Mark chapter 1 starting in verse 21. They went to Capernaum and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue who, who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know you are the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure, impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He then gives orders to the... He gives orders to impure spirits, and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Remember, back in Luke, just the week before, they tried to murder Jesus. Do you think there was demonic activity going on there in the church? Just because you didn't see a demonic expulsion, there was demonic activity going on in the church that would drive people that say they're moral, religious, Christians to an activity of something like that, just killing a prophet of God. But isn't that the pattern that the children of God have always done? Learn from what you're reading in the Old Testament so that you don't fall into that trap, so that you realize the spiritual battle that we're facing. Luke chapter 4, starting in verse 31. Then he went down to Capernaum. If you, look, if you study in anything, Capernaum's up as far as we would call it. It's like north from Sandpoint. You'd go up to Bonner's Ferry. Oh, but wait a minute. You would go down because Bonner's Ferry is at a little lower altitude. He went down off the mountain city down to the lake. You know, sometimes when we're on those mountaintop highs, we think of ourselves more highly than we ought to, don't we? And pride is just right there where the demons and devil can get his stronghold, isn't it? And we're not let, supposed to let the devil get one foothold. That refers to rock climbing, so to speak. Because you need a foothold to climb. Without your foothold, your arms will never be able to let you climb. But you get that foothold, then your arms can go and you can keep on climbing up. You can reach your goal. But if you let the devil get a foothold, what's he going to do to you? He's going to jerk you down. You're going to fall. Don't let him get any foothold in your life. It was on the Sabbath day and he taught the people. They came to learn what this new rabbi had to teach them. The rabbi would teach them what they should follow so that they could be like the rabbi. Of course, a lot of people aren't going to commit to being a disciple. They might commit to being a Christian, but a disciple is something different. That takes a cost involved, doesn't it? But you cannot be a disciple of Jesus, a Christian, and not be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You cannot be a disciple and not deny yourself and take up your cross and follow after Jesus. Who is king of your life? They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. What does that mean to you? It means that you can find truth in that teaching, power in that teaching, new teaching like I never thought before. I'd be guilty of adultery if I just had a thought that was not right. But yet that makes sense, doesn't it? It's so easy to look at the law and say, I'm not guilty of this and that, till you really sit there and examine God's law. And you don't use others as comparing. You use God's standard as a comparison. And boy, we fall way short, don't we? His words had authority. And in the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon. Doesn't say here, at least not in my, and this is NIV, doesn't say principalities or whatever. It says clearly there was a man who was demon possessed. I get asked this a lot as a pastor, and I don't know how you feel, but it, it's pretty simple. You can't be demon-possessed if Jesus Christ fills you, period. You can have demons oppress you. You do have demons oppress you. Don't think you don't. Those times when you fret, when you don't trust God and everything else, there could be that little devil you see sitting on your shoulder telling you what to do, but he can't tell you what to do. He can't make you do anything. He has no power. Jesus took the power when he died on the cross. You can say, flee from him. 
and you can leave the type of activities that you're doing. I was watching something, I'm going to admit it, I was watching something on TV the other night, and I saw something that I shouldn't have saw. And so then that's in my mind, in my image. And there's so many things that I see on TV now. Why don't I just not watch TV at all? If, unless, you know, because you see things in TV that I would have never, ever saw growing up that my parents would have definitely never, ever saw. And it conditions us down. This is part of our life that we see this stuff. And we just accept it instead of standing up. What demonic oppression and stuff is coming into our lives just because our little eyes have seen things that they shouldn't see and our little ears have heard things they shouldn't hear. There was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. Now, wait a minute. Why does Luke write this? You've got to go back to the time and everything. We got nothing to do with impure people. It will defile us. They had enough to know that. So they didn't touch a dead body or do anything else. But here there's the death and the stench of death all around them sitting in the pew right next to them. And they didn't even have a clue. Boy, if they would have had a clue, they would not have had anything to do with impurity, would they? He cried out at the top of his voice. Luke's translation is a little different. Go away. Mark started out with, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? This demon, and you look at your commentaries, you can see what you think when you read, have your own understanding. But here's what I think, period, and there's pure clarity in this. Satan came to Jesus to tempt him, to make him fall. His de demons would have had the same motive. They knew who Jesus Christ was. They knew he had power and authority, and they feared him, but they were in direct rebellion against him. So in Luke's account, I think he starts off that way where you can understand it. Go away! I don't want you here, Jesus of Nazareth, because I defy you. This is a spiritual battle that's going on. Even if we know the end and the outcome and everything, I'm going to defy you all the way, and I'm going to take as many people with me as I can. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Because you can't destroy us yet. It's not time, Jesus. We have reign in this world. But they didn't know Jesus was going to die on the cross, did they? to be that spotless sacrifice. They don't know God's plan, the mysteries of His plan. You have total faith, and you know, you know you can be assured of your faith because of what Jesus Christ did in the flesh. That He gave up heaven, He was a man, faced every temptation that we had, and went before Him with joy to the cross to die for us so that the debt price of your sins would be paid. Wow. Wow. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. I know who you are, and I defy you. Demons shudder. Good, do you? <laughs> isn't that what Scripture says? I'm paraphrasing, but isn't that what it says? Do you shudder? Constantly a topic, a word used is fear the Lord. For who he is, look at the stars, look at his handiworks, look at the intricacy of life. Who is this being that has this much knowledge and power and sustains all things? Look at what all scripture says. Look at Job and, and the cosmic battle that went on there and everything. And then know that he loves you. Wow. The only thing that can cast out negative fear is love. Because perfect love casts out all fear. You are beloved. You are his child. You are adopted into his family. But even as a family, you're reverent to your loving father because of who he is. How much more should you be reverently loving to God for what he is, who he is and what he's done for you? And even when you look at Jesus' teachings and he tells you to give up, not worry about the things of this world and give up and store up treasures in heaven, then why do you worry for one second about your job, about what you're going to eat, about anything else. I didn't say quit your job. Don't do, take my words and twist them. But why do you worry about these things? 
It is good that a man works, and if he doesn't, doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. But worry about the kingdom of God. Worry about His will in your life. Worry about serving the King of kings. Professing His name now, bowing a knee to Him now while you have the opportunity to do so with your life. Jesus answered, verse 35, Be quiet, He said sternly. All right, and I got to picture myself in church again. And let's see, I'll try to use names that we don't have in here. Ted is sitting right there, and George is sitting beside him. They've been in here Sunday after Sunday and everything. And all of a sudden, George jumps up and says these things. And then think of the body posture and things, if he was defying how he did it. I'd be freaking out a little bit. What's wrong with George here, guys? You know you guys would be thinking the same thing. George having a bad day today? Would we want to blame it on demonic activity? Maybe he's got a chemical imbalance and needs Zoloft. I don't know if Zoloft does that or not. <laughs> I don't know what that does. I, I don't, are we aware of the demonic activity and the spiritual battle that we face? that wages war for our soul. Do we put on the full armor of God? Or do so many times we take a break from the battlefield and start pulling some of the pieces of armor off? The armor of God that will protect us from everything that Satan has to throw at us. Come out of him. A command. Boy, it's very similar to... Come, follow me, isn't it? Except it's saying, come, get out of there so that you can come and follow him. The demon obeyed. Are you obeying? Are you letting Jesus make you into a fisher of men? Is that a priority for you? Or are you still fishing for yourself and everything that you do? not considering the kingdom, saying, one of these days I will. When I have time, when I've accomplished this or that. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. Mark's account says the impure spirit shook the man violently. That's what I picture because my eye, little eyes have seen movies like that before, especially where there's been a demonic expulsion the, the person foams at the mouth, rise, whatever it is, in a fight because the demon doesn't want to give up the stronghold, the, the position that he has in the person's life. And that should have injured him, but didn't. Because they can't do you any harm. Do you have faith? in Jesus Christ the worst harm they can ever do then if they can do it in any capacity is end your life and then you would be in God's presence all the people were amazed and said to each other what words these are with authority and power he gives orders to impure spirits and they come out and the news about him spread all around the area. What if we had a day like that at church here? What would you think? What would you do? How would your response be? I can tell you a lot of people wouldn't come back to church next week. <laughs> because it would be so foreign to them. What is normal in the spiritual world until it's restored I saw Satan falling from heaven Jesus said there is a war waging for your soul we need to be aware of it now 1 Peter 3.15 says tells us to live such good lives and submit to authority and everything that when we are asked of our salvation we, we tell them of the hope that we have. We don't just go out spreading the word, hey, do you know about the demonic activity in your life? Because that's going to scare some people. But be aware of it and live your life 
and don't be oppressed because if you are a child of God like I said you can't be possessed but you certainly can be oppressed when that sickness comes in your life when that turmoil comes in your life with your family when you lose your job everything else and especially if you're in and doing things you shouldn't be doing and I'm not talking excessively I'm talking about simply like I said watching something on TV and something popped up and like oh wow then are you aware of the foothold that the devil is getting into your life are you living your life ready to fight this battle Ephesians 6 12 for your struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms do you struggle if you struggle, Paul says, here, your struggle, our struggle together as a body of Christ is not against flesh and blood. It may seem like it's against flesh and blood. These people are after me and they want to persecute me and everything else. But the reason they want to persecute you again and throw you off the cliff, and don't be surprised if that happens to you if you proclaim the name of Jesus, the reason is because of the spiritual battle that's going on. And you have on your side, on your team, feeling you, however you want to say, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who's already accomplished all this on the cross. And who simply says, fight the battle until I come back and make all things new. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be alert and sober of mind, or of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And does that not imply that his demons are doing the same? And that means he's in hiding, he's in waiting. You don't see him until what? He pounces on you and you're fighting for your life. And that lion is not there to just scare you. That lion is there to devour you, to eat you up. And those words are written to Christians, not non-Christians. If you notice, Jesus, or the demon said, what have you got to do with us? He was speaking on his own, but he was talking about his whole camaraderie of soldiers that were fighting this battle. Oh, man, that opens up some new questions, wasn't there? Okay, Ted was there and George was there. Billy. <laughs> Billy was over here in disguise, trying to keep the rest of the people from truly following Jesus don't you think there were other soldiers of the devil present that day when you get to think about it and you sit there and, and contemplate the spiritual battle that's going on then maybe you'll see the complexity the danger of it all now I'm not implying that there's a bunch of Billy's and Ted's or not Ted, Ted was okay George is in here today and everything but we need to be aware. And the, just to be aware, we might see that, oh, Billy is having problems in his life today because he's over, undergoing this. And some demons have come in to attack him even though he is saved. And they're oppressing him. And his faith is wavering. And we need to comfort him because the God of all comfort has comforted us. So maybe we need to be aware of it for that reason. But be aware that there is a spiritual battle. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. I don't even fathom what those different things are. And against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. No, it's not their time for be, to be destroyed. It is their time to roam the earth. But they have no power or dominion in your life no authority the key things here in Jesus' teachings is that he had authority and he had power and he gave that authority and power to you all authority in heaven and earth has been given to you therefore go and make disciples and then stay with them and teach them to obey everything because you're there with them so you see what's going on in Billy's life and you're there to help him and then another person comes along because we're all part of the body so that you don't get taken down in this battle. Part of the, the, 
if you look at the soldiers of that day, part of the defense mechanism with the different components of the soldiers' armies was to literally take their shields and barricade each other when the war really got hot around them, and they made a barricade around them where no arrows or anything could come through. They protected one another by putting a shield all the way around them. If they would not have stood together like that, they would have been picked off individually. We are the body of Christ, soldiers in his army. We know the final end of the battle, but we've got to fight until that day comes. And James tells us, do you know, that they said, we know you that you're the holy one. Or he said, I know that you're the holy one is what it says. James 2.19 says, you believe that there is one God, good, even demons believe that and shudder. Your commander in chief, are you fearfully following him, not in fear that you're going to be reprimanded, but in fear of who he is in reverent awe? I'll use those words instead. Fighting this battle, or are you over on the sidelines? Because people that sit over on the sidelines don't realize what's going on until all of a sudden the war is on top of them and they can't defend themselves. When Jesus told him to be quiet and come out of him, the words used there literally in Scripture are hold one's peace. That demon was trying to give Jesus a peace of his mind. You've heard that. There's that better understanding. That's what the words literally mean. He was trying to tell him, hey, this is our battle. This is our war. And Jesus said, be quiet. The battle's over. You don't belong here come out of this man now whether the man came and served him or not we don't know the man is, is, is nameless but we know that what Jesus does is he sets us free he sets the captives free this is the day of the Lord's favor is this the day of your salvation all the people were amazed and said to each other what words these are with authority and power he gives orders to impure spirits and they come out the church was amazed at what happened that day in church where did it lead to that's why I said maybe we need to have a day like that what, what, what do we need to do to get a fire under us to get excited to get, to get fearful to serve God whatever you're, you're looking at would something like that do it or would the next week at church, what would we find? I mean, these are legitimate questions to think about. And the demonic activity is still the same today that it was in Jesus' day, that it was in the Old Testament days. They're waging war for your soul. And if you're in the Lord's army, you can't say that you're not there to wage war, to battle. I don't care where you're at. Fred knows some about military and some of the others may. I don't care where you're at. You're still all called to fight. Fighting's heavier here than it is there, but you're all ready to fight, and you're equipped to fight. So just because you're not on the front lines doesn't mean you're not one of the Lord's soldiers. You're not in his army. Your battles are just fought a little differently, but they're still the same. You're still waging the same battle. It's an intentional warfare against every single one, against the church and every Christian, every day, there is no time of peace. There is no sleeping. There is no day when we take off and stop waging war. Ephesians, this is what Paul writes in Ephesians so that we're prepared to understand it. Starting in verse 10 of Ephesians 6, Finally, be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. He's planning attacks. You don't have to worry about the armor. You've got God's armor, his full armor. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is a war raging in every aspect that we know, in the world and in the heavens. <clears throat> Therefore... Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, what day that is, depending on whether you're on the front lines or you're back in the office in the, in the war, stand, uh, 
Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that the day when the evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm. Continue to stand firm. Don't lose your ground. With the belt of truth buckled around your waist, knowing what God's word says, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, protecting your heart so that your heart doesn't change its motives, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace to spread the good news that peace has come to those who believe in Jesus Christ. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one that you use as an offensive and defensive. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kind of prayers and requests. How many times do we forget that prayer as part of the battle? Pray in the Spirit on all occasions and with all kind of prayers so that Billy doesn't isn't opposed with this again so that George is healed that the demons are cast out of his life and it's take spend time to finding out that that's the case so that he doesn't fall back into that with this in mind be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people this is not all we're going to see of demons in, in Luke. You know it's not in any gospel or anything. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus casts out a legion of demons. Funny that, that it's a legion because that's a fighting term again. Do you know what it means? It's a military unit of 6,826 soldiers. 6,100 of them are on foot and 726 of them are on horseback. And they're fighting a war against one man. Or if you read the gospels well, there's two men. Oh, well, that changed the odds, didn't it? One to two men versus 6,826. And Jesus defeated them with the word. And he told the man that we know about to go back and spread the news of him in his land, to be that witness. He didn't know if those demons would come back or anything else, but Jesus set him free and said, here's your mission. Go fight a legion. You're not alone. And the victory's been won. Is that how you view it? Is that how you view it when that crisis will come in your life or has been in your life? In Luke chapter 9, Jesus casts out a demon from a child. It's the father, when they come down off the mountain, that wanted the church to cast out the demon, but they couldn't do it. And Jesus tells them later that, that the reason they couldn't is because they didn't pray enough. Oh, all these things are tied together, aren't they? This was a child. Wait a minute, this isn't fair. We shouldn't have spiritual warfare on our children. Really? We sinned against God. We're in a fallen world, but He loves us enough to save us. No wonder we should write on the doorposts of our house. No wonder we should talk about it when we get up, when we go about, when we sit down to eat, when we go to bed. No wonder we should say prayers over them and teach them how to pray. Are you doing that? In Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out the the 72, and they rejoice over casting out demons. I'll read a few verses from there, starting in verse 17. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. What demons have submitted to you in the name of Jesus? You've got to ask, what demons are you fighting then? Didn't say you were demon-possessed, but there is demon oppression going on in each and every one of our lives. You need to be aware of it, where it's at. And have you told them they'd have no place in your life? If you're struggling with pornography because you're lust again, have you told them they have no place in your life? And have you given it over to God and let the Spirit change you and conform you? That's just one example. I don't know your examples. Even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. I, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the powers of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Don't take the verse out of context. A lot of people do. And go do other things. You've got the power to overcome all the attacks and schemes of the devil and his demons. Nothing will harm you. Verse 20. However, or a but, here's the opposite. Do not rejoice that spirits submit to you. I think it'd be pretty cool if I said to George, boo, when that happened, 
and everything. But wait a minute, don't rejoice because then pride would come in and everything else. But that's not what I'm supposed to rejoice over as a Christian anyway. What am I supposed to rejoice over? That my name is written in heaven. And how can I not proclaim that? How can I not tell others of that? How can I not tell them how Jesus has freed me from the demons that possess me, so to speak, using that terminology, and even from the demons that still oppress me? Jesus Christ has freed me and, and saved me from all of that and will continue to every minute of my life as long as I allow him, as long as I submit to the King of kings and Lord of lords. However, do not rejoice that the Spirit submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. Here we've got again where Luke wrote that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit, and this time full of joy. Maybe he wasn't as joyful when he got led into the wilderness. I don't know. But here we, he was joyed because little children, God had told them about the things of heaven, and they came to salvation. Because all they needed was mustard, size, seed, faith. All they needed was childlike faith. I trust you, Daddy. Throw me up in the air, and I know you'll catch me. I'm not going to worry about anything else. I'm just going to have joy that you're my Father. Is that how you live your life? Are your names written in heaven? Are you rejoicing? Are you realizing that you're fighting a fight, and are you equipped, dressed for battle, ready to serve? Oh, I can relate that to other things, can I? And fighting the war that happens to be in your battlefront today. Peter tells us again, 1 Peter chapter 5, starting in verse 6, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxieties on him because he hears you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. I just gave you each one little verse last time. This is why I'm reading you more of the scriptures this time. What's there? You've got to humble yourself before God. You've got to get off of your throne, off your seat, off your control and give him control. You've got to let God's mighty hand control you, not a, a, a hand of abuse, but a hand of guidance, a, gu a hand of correction, that he may lift you up in time, cast all of your fears, all of your anxieties and everything on him because he cares for you. Okay, again, I can have no fear when he throws me up in the air. Be alert and sober mind. There is a battle going on. And what specifically here, your enemy, the devil, is prowling around, seeking whom he may devour. So resist him. Stand firm again in the faith. Stand till you can't stand no more. And after you stand, stand still. Stand firm because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same things, the same kind of sufferings. They're fighting this spiritual battle. Theirs may be a little different. They may be taken to gallows to be hung for their, for their faith. Yours may simply be, hey, I need to reach out and witness to this person at work or I need to get this out of my life or whatever it is I need to be a better friend and companion did you get a uh, accountability buddy for your devotions are you doing that right there could be something you could make a big difference in someone else's life I don't know what it looks like in your life but I know this we're not called to be spectators we're called to be part of the battle it doesn't end. It's each and every day. And we know that the victory comes in Jesus Christ. Billy Graham said Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's something in which we become totally involved. There are two armies marching across the battlefield of your soul. Each has a mark, marked, markedly different agenda they are fighting. I don't know about all the rest of the story, do you? But I know that one will win and one will lose. Do you know victory in your life through Jesus Christ? And are you living a victorious life in Jesus Christ? Today is the day of the Lord's favor.
That demon had nothing in common with Jesus, and he had nothing in common with those who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We know that something good has come out of Nazareth, <laughs> our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who willingly went to the cross to save us. This is the year of the Lord's favor. This is the year to proclaim freedom, to give sight, to set the oppressed free. Just like Jesus said, it is a time for us to do that. I am no longer a child of the devil. I am a child of light. So is my light shining before men? Do they see my good works and glorify my Father in heaven? Is the light that is coming through me because of Jesus Christ, is it expelling the darkness in the world around me? And are we coming together and lighting our world even more for Jesus? 2 Corinthians 10, starting in verse 3. For though we live in the world, we do not wage, wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. Are you obeying Jesus Christ? Are you reading His Word? Are you planted into ministry wherever it's at, whether it's in His church or somewhere else? Are you living a life that brings glory and honor to Jesus Christ? Or are you unaware of the spiritual battle? Do you not care about your loved ones that don't know Jesus? Do you just not have the time? Is, is Jesus Christ the King of your life? By Jesus' authority and power, we demolish the strongholds that the demons and His devil have on this earth ushering in the kingdom of God, that His will be done, that His kingdom come. Are you ready to march off to war? Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for the victory that comes in Jesus Christ. We thank you for your words. We thank you that your word is truth, that you will sanctify us with the truth and with your spirit, Lord. We thank you that we're tied together with fellowship with one another, that even when we're not with each other we're with each other spiritually and that you hear our prayers oh father help us to to see the spiritual ramifications to put our heart more to prayer to put our minds and our hearts and our bodies to action for one another lord because your word is clear that we fight this spiritual battle that's waging war for our souls and that we're to love others and think of others over ourselves father so help us to be the kind of christians that are like christ in this world to lay down our lives, our desires, our things to serve someone else, especially each other, but even more, Father, to serve the King of kings and Lord of lords. Teach us, Jesus, how to be fishers of men. Increase our faith. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the freedom that we have. Help us not to be complacent with it, Lord, but to use these freedoms as an opportunity in a time that has some less intense battles being fought to go out there and, and spread the gospel message more, to have our feet dressed with the gospel of peace, Father. We thank you and praise you in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.